All right, we're starting Unit 9, which is magnetism. Uh, and the first part of our unit, Chapter 22, is magnetism and magnetic fields. So we're going to look at, again, you know, what's, a, what's a magnet, what's a magnetic field, um, how does magnetism arise from electric currents, and what are uh, the magnetic forces that can arise due to those magnetic fields. So key thing about magnets is you always have two poles. You always have a north and a south pole. Uh, if I was to break that magnet, I'll end up with still two poles, a north and a south pole on each piece. North and south, north and south. You can never have a single pole isolated, something called a monopole. We've never found it. It'd be kind of cool if we could find it in physics, but we've never found a monopole, an isolated south or an isolated north pole. They always come in pairs on a magnet. Key thing about magnets is, you know, opposites attract, likes repel, just like with electric charges. So if I put a north pole near a south pole, they attract. Put a north near a north or a south near a south, they repel. Okay. So again, this is kind of a key piece to understanding how magnets behave, how they're still kind of related to electric fields and electric forces also. So the electric field. Um, so basically, an electric field is going to contain energy, just like the, the, the magnetic field, just like the electric field does. Um, and the greater that energy or the greater the intensity of the field, the closer those lines are going to be together. So just like on this image here, you notice know, towards the actual poles here, really, really close, intense field, because it's going to be stronger here, more energy there. Um, we're going to use a capital B to represent the magnetic field. Easiest way to actually visualize these is just using iron filings. So you'll see lots of images of iron filings with magnets, um, or small beads with magnets that you can just, you know, put near it to see how strong it is, um, metal beads. Now, another way to do this is you can also use compasses to help visualize this. Um, so you can put compasses near the magnetic field. So if I put it so north is up here, and see it points this way, points this way, points this way, points this way. The field always seems to leave the north pole and wrap around towards the south pole. Just like with a electric charge, we always seem to leave the positive and go towards the negative. It's like we always leave north, go towards south. And we're making these, these fully closed loops um, with the magnetic fields. And we define the direction, again, using a compass needle. How would a, a compass point at that particular point in space, and how strongly does it want to point that way? It tells us that magnetic field's direction. So now the Earth has its own magnetic field. So we watched that video um, before break that got into the idea of, well, why do we have the magnetic field? It has to do with the, the whole movement of the, the magma within the Earth and the, the electrical currents within it, which we'll explain a little more about the electrical currents in a minute. What we notice is that the magnetic axis and the rotational axis aren't the same. Right now they're around 11 degrees different, and there is a little bit of wandering that happens, um, as I talked about in the video. But what we find is that the north pole of a compass points towards Earth's north pole, which really tells us that it's a south pole of a magnet at the geographic north pole, and that's the north pole of a magnet at the geographical south pole. Kind of an interesting thing to think about, just based on how we've defined a compass. For a magnetic field, we're going to be generally measuring in Teslas. And Teslas are a very large unit. Um, the Earth's magnetic field itself is only about 5 times 10 to the negative 5th Teslas. The other common unit you might see is the Gauss. Uh, and one Gauss is 10 to the negative 4th Teslas. So here's a little table that shows some example values in Gauss. So Earth is only about 0 0.5 Gauss, right? So if I converted that, yeah, I get 0.5 Gauss. Um, Two other very big magnets you might experience at some point in your life are MRIs. So a low field MRI is about 2,000 Gauss or 2 Tesla. A very high field MRI um, is about 15,000 Gauss or 15 Tesla. Um, again, just showing the conversion factors on there. Now, what actually makes permanent magnets occur gets into the actual kind of internals of the material, something we call magnetic domains. So for most materials, the domains are not aligned. So imagine them all just pointing in random directions, and if I added all those directions up, we had zero for the internal field. And what causes these internal fields is the spin of electrons and the rotation of electrons around the atoms. Now, if all of a sudden they start to align in the same direction, we start to gain a magnetic field in the same direction. Okay? We gain magnetic domains that are aligned. And the more you can align the domains, the stronger the magnetic field is for a permanent magnet. The first person to figure out, though, there was a connection to current between magnetism was Hans Christian Oersted. Um, there's another researcher by the last name of Henry that was also around the same time looking at this, but Oersted's the first to kind of have that aha moment. And what it was, he was doing a science lecture 
with a, a, a circuit that had a wire and a switch, and as he closed the switch, he noticed that the, the compass that he had on the table nearby started to move. And every time he opened and closed the switch, the compass moved, and the compass kept moving. So he started to investigate, well, why was it moving? Because he knew that compasses moved because of magnets, so that means that there was a magnet being formed around the wire. Um, and he was able to use the compasses to help visualize the magnetic field around the wire and how it changed depending on which direction the current flowed. So it came up with our first right hand rule. So the first right hand rule is if I took my hand, used my thumb in the right hand to indicate the direction of current, my fingers wrapping around that straight wire would show me the direction of the magnetic field. Now, to actually calculate that magnetic field, we got into having to use something called the permeability of free space. And for the permeability of free space, we find the value of 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 tesla meters per amp. Okay? And we're going to use mu sub zero or mu naught to represent it. Current is going to be a factor, and then how far we are away from the wire is going to be a factor. So this 2 pi r piece comes into play. So mu naught times i over 2 pi r will be the strength of the magnetic field. But now what happens if I start to coil those wires into loops instead of having a straight wire? Well, I start to notice that all of my kind of north-south pieces would clump together in the middle of that, that loop, and I'd get a much stronger field there than I would outside it. So I start to notice I'd have this thing forming called a solenoid. Um, so just the simplest would be just a single loop, but as I add more and more loops to it, the solenoid gets stronger and stronger and stronger. But again, it's because here in the middle, as I loop around, all of those magnetic fields would get more dense, more you know, more strength, because the closer the field lines are together, the stronger the magnetic field is. So for the solenoid, we actually could have multiple coils, you know, setting up some length. And the further you get away outside of the coil, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. The closer we are to the center of the coil, though, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And this is what we normally refer to when we think of an electromagnet. Okay. So this is why when we did the telegraph project, you coiled wire around a nail. So coiling the wire made the electromagnet. We used the nail to help kind of center that field on a piece of metal so that it would be something to be attracted to it. So for a solenoid, we have to calculate the number of loops, we'll call n, and the length l of that coil. Again, along with the permeability of free space. So we end up with the magnetic field for a solenoid as b equals mu naught times n over l times i. So that n over l is that ratio of the number of loops to the length of the solenoid. So once we have fields, we can start to figure out, well, how, how are the forces affected? Well, what if I put a charged particle in a magnetic field? What would happen? Well, I find that if I put a charged particle perpendicular to a magnetic field, I get a maximum force on it. If the charged particle is parallel to the magnetic field, there's almost no force on it. And if it's at some angle to it, I find out that that force is related to the charge times the velocity times the magnetic field sine of theta. So with this force being QVB sine of theta, we have to remember, though, that the force on that charged particle okay, ends up being at a different angle than we'd expect because the magnetic field will be in one direction, the velocity will be in one direction, but that force is going to be perpendicular to the velocity, which means we're actually not going to speed up or slow down. We're only going to change direction because of the magnetic field. All right. And this becomes very useful for things like televisions. So early TVs, CRT TVs, the big tube TVs, used to use magnetic fields to aim the electrons up or down on the screen to kind of form the picture on the screen. So with this right-hand rule, we're going to use the thumb to represent the force our index finger to represent the direction of the velocity, and then our middle finger to represent the direction of the magnetic field. So in this case, the force has to be perpendicular to both the magnetic field and the velocity. And for the maximum force, we want to have that velocity and that magnetic field perpendicular to each other. Now, if I, again, have my magnetic field in this image pointing into the screen, that's why I have a circle with an X. So my B would be into the screen, so my middle finger kind of be into the screen. My index finger V, the velocity would be pointing to the right. If it's a positively charged particle, my thumb would point up. If it was a negatively charged particle, though, my thumb would point down the opposite direction of it. So you can see how it 
goes one way or the other. And this explains again why we get you know the images from the CRTs, how you get things like the northern lights that form as the charged particles spin down along the magnetic field lines and you know get excited to light up. The velocity of the charged particles are, is always again always going to be perpendicular to that magnetic field and the velocity piece. So we end up getting things that form in circles. Again, this is also related back to how things like synchrocyclotrons work, which we needed to understand how those worked to do the atomic bomb project, or also to do a lot of cancer treatment, so PET, proton emission therapy. Um, that's how that works. It's using this, this concept of, I can put a charged particle in a magnetic field and spin it up. So now if it's just a current in a wire, the force is gonna just be equal to ILB sine theta. Again, following the right hand rule, force is the thumb, current is the index finger, now instead of velocity, and B is the middle finger. 